recently, I had an opportunity. I was fortunate to um, have an experience with Perzai, where I worked on a project where we had chance to take this approach. And today, I would like to share with you its benefits that I found and lessons learned, and perhaps maybe even motivate you to try it if you consider that uh, useful. Before we dive in into that topic, I would like to first ask you here if you ever tried her design or at least heard about it. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, it's true is that it's not really a common method. However, it's really worth considering it for complex projects or complex problems. Speaking of complex problems, I would like to give you more idea, to get a better idea of what I mean with that, at least from our experience, so we can compare it, what does it mean for you. Uh, in my team, we are working on our own booking management system, which is uh, our homegrown tool for to support needs of our customer support agents. We have over 1,500 users all over the world, and we need to provide them tools so they can support our customers. <coughs> and talking about customer support, we have identified that we have eight user roles. So you can imagine that they have completely different workflow and needs. And giving you a little bit more detail what challenge we are facing, we were about to come up with a new concept of itinerary, which basically for you as a traveler, customer, is basically something that describes that you travel from A to B when you need to be on airport and some basic information. However, for um, customer support agent, it's a completely different thing. They need to see much more information to support our customers. Either it's special payment information, reservation numbers, or any specific details that are not relevant uh, for customers. And basically, to, to tackle this issue, I paired up with Andrei Kiripolsky, our researcher. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> so, um, what is fair design? Basically, I could maybe share something about his story, that it was pioneered by Cooper uh, Agency in San Francisco, that they basically came up with this concept when they were sending pairs in to, to, to the clients, and that's how it started. And it was evolving over decades, so many people contributed to that methodology. And maybe you ever heard about pair programming. It shares a lot of patterns with programming in pairs. Basically, uh, pair design could be rephrased in those words, co-creation and thought partnership. Here I would like to say what it is, I would also like to say what it is not. So you can compare it to the common approach. Uh, it is not feedback uh, in a sense of that you work alone and you meet your colleague once a time and you ask for opinion or feedback. And it's not a collaboration in a sense that you close in a room with a bunch of designers and you compete with whose idea is better. There are basically two principles to describe this method. Working together closely, which means there are two brains available for the project from the beginning till the end. They work together and basically it's all benefit because there are no distractions and they are more effective uh, while they are working. Uh, let's have a look at it. Um, there is, uh, the benefit of it is that there is shared ownership uh, basically of what you're creating. There is shared responsibility. So it gives you possibility to make it great because when you're responsible for it you want to contribute 100% and you also share risks and rewards so no matter if you fail or succeed the 
total division. That's the second principle. People at Cooper uh, called um, those two roles in the pair gen and synth, which stands for generator and synthesizer. So let's give you some uh, little theory what is uh, what this role is about. Generator is basically responsible for brainstorming a bunch of quality ideas. Sometimes they don't have to be really uh, perfect, they are often half-baked and they are offered for discussion and for next iteration. This person needs to be also equipped with design patterns so it's have uh, some uh, some knowledge to make this brainstorming fast. On the other hand, in the pair, there is synthesizer, which already says that this person is synthesizing the work of the generator. Basically what that means. Synthesizer is basically keeping the big picture, is making sure that all needs are covered, because the generator is, let's say, dive in the uh, detail and the synthesizer is keeping the big picture, so it's making sure that you will not mm, miss some important uh, need or persona or stuff like that. And basically, the, there is a kill, uh, like the, the key skill set, uh, which is empathic skepticism, which means that the person needs to be uh, providing a skeptical mindset to evaluating each thought of the uh, generator while also being empathic uh, in a sense of uh, trying to understand the rationale of the generator why he or she came with that idea and basically this way they continue and debate the pros and cons on the fly so it was pretty fast. so right now you get some kind of basic theory or, or you can maybe get some idea what it's about and you might ask, okay, it's nice, but how I will use it in, in practice? How it fits into the design process? Basically, uh, it fits, I can say that it fits in the entire design process. And today I will talk mostly about the exploration phase, like research and sense making, fire framing, and detail design. Talking about uh, research and sense making, in our case, we were facing two big unknown. We were in front of us eight different user roles, and we needed to first find out how they interact with itinerary. Mm -hmm. What kind of information they need, at least in our legacy tools we used in the past. What are the pains? And basically to understand opportunities of each of those roles. And you can imagine that once you start talking to all of them, you can get really uh, big headache because it's a lot of information. Especially in fast growing startup where there is basically uh, chaos in the information that goes through fast. So how does it work with in this space? Those roles that I described before, generator and synthesizer, in this space they those roles are basically similar. They work together either on pre preparing the interviews, like it was in our case, or uh, even uh, conducting the interviews. Here it's important to say that uh, to avoid some, uh, let's say, you need to specify a leader of the interview in that case. Because you can imagine when two people are let's say, interrogating the user, it can feel quite unpleasant. So it's good that before you decide who will be leading the interview. In our case, it was mostly Andre, who is our researcher, and he's more skilled in that. But when it was necessary, and you get tired, so you can even switch the roles. The benefits of this phase is that you gain shared understanding, which, in my personal experience, it was the most valuable part of our experience in working in Paris. Because when you work together and learning a lot of new information from users and domain, <coughs> uh, you, let's say, learn very fast and later you have somebody that you, somebody that you can discuss with uh, complex problems. And it also brings actionable understanding how to solve problems that are addressed during the research. So both know what to do, there is no bottleneck between research and design that you don't have to 
and there were some insights. Both know what to do. Sketching and wireframing. This was another phase once we understood a little bit more about our users and problems we need to uh, we need to solve. I have to say it was my personally uh, uh, most interesting part because it was the time where the most heated debates happened. We were arguing a lot and it was really fun. In this phase of uh, sketching and wireframing, uh, you can see that the roles become more distinct. It's becoming more difference between the generator and synthesizer, where you can already see the difference. Where here in this case, generator leads the concept uh, creation, which means it comes with the ideas and all the things I said in the introduction, where synthesizer is leading the concept evolution, which in practical sense means that it's asking uh, questions, uh, raising concerns, or even connecting existing concepts, or even keeping the generator on the ground and make things realistic. Because uh, the generator is more in ideation phase and things a little bit out of uh, boundaries. The benefits of this is you iterate really fast because you have somebody that is with you and it, it goes really fast that you find out if it's a really good idea or not. Second, um, based on this instant feedback, okay, you get instant feedback. And in our case, um, we were, uh, I think we see it like the biggest benefit that we define the common language because there were so many special, unique words for specific things in, in the systems with, uh, or the jargon of uh, CS systems, uh, customer support systems, etc. And we needed to find how to talk together so we understand. Because even in the company, people were calling the same things differently. And we need to make clear that we communicate in the same language. Uh, well, uh, later, there were some phases that I will, I'm skipping right now in this presentation, but we went also through some validation and we validated the information and prototypes with users. And even that you can use per design to go and see in reality how, how it works. Once we were done, we jumped into the detailed design. In this phase, um, we were working more separately. Uh, that means that it's not necessary that you sit in the same room or um, you cooperate intensively together because there are separate tasks. So you can sit next to each other or be somewhere else. It's really important. In this case, generator is pushing pixels and trying to deliver the high fidelity deliveries for, uh, for developers for, for some further discussions. And synthesizer is basically documenting all design decisions or specification for handover. And Basically, they don't need to really work next to each other. They just need to sync once a day or at the end of the week and decide what will be next. Yes, and there were also lessons learned. Uh, first one, uh, I would like to say that I found it, at least in our case, that it was a super effective process. Even if it may sound that you invest time of two people, it was really uh, effective uh, because you don't get stuck when you are solving really complex stuff. Uh, you can even swap roles. So if somebody doesn't know how to continue or you get stuck, you can switch the roles and you can become synthesizer, generator, or vice versa. Uh, another good point that I realized later that it may be a really great uh, method how to onboard people, either to test newcomers how they really cooperate in their probation time. We haven't tested, but it came recently this idea that it might be a really great idea to do. And second, uh, regarding onboarding to product domain, especially when it's complex like this, it helps, uh, for example, when you hire new people or even their junior designers, it helps them to involve uh, people in the process and they learn very fast. And basically, 
another thing is that you are building the right thing. At least you are going the direction. Because when you work in pairs, you are constantly making sure, because of the shared responsibility, that you want to build the good stuff. And another thing, in our case, we paired a uh, like designer and researcher. Uh, which we found really beneficial because there are different perspectives and different past experiences and also uh, different skill set. So Andre contributed more in research and I could learn from him and vice versa. So it's also um, give benefits to each party. Uh, this, I think it's also worth mentioning that you can pair up also other people. You can pair designer, 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 product manager, or even developer. So it depends on the case. And another positive thing is that we learned a lot. It was really great investment of learning into a complex domain that even once the project ended, we, it really paid off several times. Any time I needed to discuss something really complex, I could share with Andre, and I didn't have to even onboard him. He already knew the background of all, all the problematics. So it's really great to, uh, to share and some deep knowledge. And from the, let's say, negative lessons learned that I would definitely consider in future is that since we started more spontaneously using this method, we didn't plan uh, or consider Andre's vacation because he was having uh, final exams at his university, which would be okay that you could say that you need to postpone, but in the real world you need to give deadlines and you need to deliver. So the last phase, of the detailed design, I needed to take over that part and I need to finish certain parts without him, which really didn't make the flow like the perfect way it would be. <coughs> he lost basically the part of the ownership at the last part of uh, the process. But overall, I would like to say that fair design makes people happier. And let me, let me tell you what I mean with that. I have to say that it was one of my personal best experiences in design last year the, it, because it was fun. It was fun, it was successful, we delivered the stuff and it works. And it was fun also because you share success and also frustration which makes, makes it really easy to go through something difficult. And besides things like that it improved design culture and stuff like that, at the bottom line it makes happy users because it forces you to deliver a high quality uh, thing. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.